questions, question oral, honorable... The Honorable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is gifted with a very particular sort of incompetence. Since coming to power, he's increased the cost of the bureaucracy by 50%, but at the same time, he's managed to convince the biggest union to call the biggest public service strike in 40 years. Who could have imagined such an achievement? Now it's uh, veterans, immigrants, and our small businesses and taxpayers who won't have access to services. When is the Prime Minister going to fix what his government has broken? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say that, you know, uh, public servants right now are uh, people who offer very important service to the government and to the people of Canada. And we are in discussions with them, bargaining right now uh, to make sure that we have a competitive, fair agreement and that's going to be reasonable for taxpayers. So we are working very hard at the bargaining table right now, and we're going to continue to do that until we find an agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Gaut saint charles Why isn't the Prime Minister not standing up to answer these questions? Why is the Prime Minister not working for Canadians? Is he busy planning a new holiday with his buddies in a luxurious hotel, uh, you know, uh, more, with more donors to the Trudeau Foundation. He's not thinking about people who uh, need to get their passports. He's not uh, pe thinking about people in airports. He's got a private jet. He's not thinking about small businesses. He's never had to balance a budget. Canadians want an answer. When is he going to get back to work to fix the problems that he's created? Leader. The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, for the third day, yes, the Prime Minister took a vacation over Christmas with his family in... Uh, the home of uh, one of his friends. That's the truth. For the third day in a row, yes, that's the case. Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. It's a special type of liberal incompetence to not only blow up the bureaucracy by 50%, spending $21 billion of taxpayer money, while also causing the largest public sector strike seen in 40 years. Even before the strike, these liberals were breaking records, creating massive backlogs at passport offices, Service Canada, airports and immigration. And apparently, not even the public servants could stand this liberal government's incompetence anymore. Can the Prime Minister stand up and inform this House how it feels to break the record for government incompetence? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, public servants from the PSAC provide important services to Canadians and the government value their work. We are committed to reaching agreements that are competitive, that are fair to the public servants, but also that are reasonable for Canadians. And we also, as a government, believe that they have a right to strike. And we will be working with them to make sure, because we're continuing at the table to get to a deal, and we're working very hard together to get to this deal. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. The only people getting ahead in this Prime Minister's Canada today are crony Liberal insiders covering his vacations and insiders. 40% of Canadians are borrowing from family just to make ends meet. One in five are skipping meals. People literally eating out of dumpsters in Vancouver because of Liberal inflation. And typical Liberal logic, their solution is to raise taxes like their failed carbon tax scam, adding an extra 41 cents per litre to fuel up and to heat homes. Why won't the Prime Minister scrap this scam and let Canadians get ahead for once instead of himself and his crony insiders? The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of hypocrisy and misinformation, but I'll pose a question back to the other side. The Leader of the Opposition gets up every morning in a government-funded bed and go... We started off really well, and now all of a sudden it's getting out of hand. I'm going to ask the government house leader to start over again, and I want to just I want to hear what he says. I think everyone else does as well. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition gets up in a government-funded bed, in a government-funded house. He oh. enters a government-funded car, where he's driven by a government-funded driver, where he goes to a government-funded office with government-funded staff. Seriously? And I wonder when he gets on his government-funded phone and talks to big tech giants from other countries about oh. how they can destroy the CBC and other Shame. public broadcasting. Shame. I wonder, uh, when he talks to them about his Twitter account, uh, what percentage of public funded, given that he's worked his entire life for the federal paycheck? What is it, 99.8%? Is it 99.9%, .9%, Mr. Speaker? Believing that is as ridiculous 
says believing the NDP are still an opposition party. And this Kossi coalition would rather virtue signal with their carbon tax scam, forcing more into food banks and making one in five Canadians go broke. The Liberal Environment Minister finally admitted that the carbon tax was a scam all along, and the PBO backed that up by proving that Canadians pay more into this scam than what they get back into carbon pricing rebates. Why doesn't the Kossi coalition do the right thing to help Canadians and finally scrap the scam? Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Listen to conspiracies from the Conservatives, and I wonder how they square this when they're on 4chan and subreddits talking about these various conspiracy theories. The Conservative Party of Canada is more than 40% funded by government funding. I wonder when they talk uh, to, again, these companies that are from other countries trying to destroy our public broadcaster, uh, and they're talking to those people, uh, do they talk about what percent the Conservative Party of Canada should say is government funded as well as their federal leader? No, no, no. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister keeps telling us that he hasn't been involved with the Trudeau Foundation for 10 years. But today everyone's talking about his uh, holiday trip to friends from the Foundation. But that's not it. In 2016, when it came to the d donation from uh, the, Beij the Beijing regime, his office directly contacted the Foundation. Then, when it came time to study foreign affairs and elections, he named the ex-CEO of the Foundation. And now, as a special reporter, he's named another member of the Foundation. So does that not seem like that's quite a lot of involvement with the Foundation for somebody who's not supposed to be involved with the Foundation at all? The Honourable Government House Leader. The Prime Minister has already explained on a number of occasions that it's completely clear that the Prime Minister is not involved with the Foundation, not at all, not in a direct or indirect way. There is no connection and has not been for over 10 years. That's the facts, Mr. Speaker. That's clear and that is the case. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the Prime Minister is still uh, tightly linked to the Trudeau Foundation, and that's really important because at the same time, it's just as clear that China also wants to be very closely involved with the Foundation with its generous uh, donation uh, in honour of uh, Trudeau Sr. So why? What's China's goal here? Well, that's the $140,000 question, and are we going to get the answer? Well, the rapporteur who's supposed to give us that answer by uh, looking into uh, Chinese interference is a member of the Foundation himself and a personal friend of the Prime Minister. So you'll understand why we're not going to stop calling for an independent public inquiry. The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that uh, China's goal uh, uh, is different from uh, the goals of anyone else here in this House of Commons. Foreign interference is uh, very concerning for every member of this House and every member of the House of Commons uh, is responsible for protecting our democracy uh, and everyone uh, in this House uh, uh, is, uh, is Canadian and proud to be it. The Honourable Member for Rosemont of Petit Patrie. Mr. Speaker, we've learned that this Liberal government has spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on private contracts uh, uh, for companies to, doing work of, of uh, public servants. $100 uh, million to Price Waterhouse, $200 million to Deloitte, $45 million to Accenture. The Liberals are unable to negotiate a good agreement with the Federal Public Service, but when it's time to write checks to their friends in the big companies, well, there it's open bar. Why is it so hard for the Liberals to put the interests of workers ahead of the interests of their rich and powerful buddies? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this important question. Um, obviously, uh, we are looking very closely at management consultants. Uh, they are used only in the case where we need uh, specific expertise or in the case of uh, fluctuating workload. Uh, but I can assure the member that we are always looking to ensure that we get the best value for Canadians. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. 
Speaker, Canadians were shocked when news broke of this government's reckless outsourcing to McKinsey. This week we learned that it was just the tip of the iceberg. In the last year, the Liberals handed out more than $200 million to Deloitte, $100 million to PricewaterhouseCoopers, and $45 million to Accenture for contracts with a single department. The Liberals seem to have no problem giving massive public handouts to their rich friends while delaying a fair deal for public sector workers. So will the Liberals put an end to this unchecked outsourcing and instead invest in Canada's public service by coming up with a fair deal? The Honourable Minister for Public Service. I'd like to thank the member for Courtney Alberni uh, for his question and also for the work of the Government Operations Committee in studying the use of management consultants. And so I'm sure the member is very pleased that in Budget 2023 we propose to reduce spending on consulting other professional services and travel by roughly 15% of planned 2023-24 discretionary spending in these areas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, it takes a special type of incompetence to spend 50% more on the bureaucracy, yet have the largest public service strike in 40 years. It takes a special type of incompetence to not only have passport delays, but also delays in immigration processes, as well as tax returns. And it takes a special type of incompetence to spend $22 billion on outside consultants and still end up in the same strike position. It's Mr. True. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister apologize for his incompetence and end this strike? The Honourable Minister for Families. Unlike the Conservatives opposite, we respect collective bargaining, we respect the right to strike, and we understand that negotiations need to happen at the negotiating table. Mr. Speaker, our government has been extraordinarily engaged to ensure that we get a fair deal for Canadians, a fair deal for the workers, and a fair deal for government. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to negotiate in good faith and to ensure that we can continue to deserve uh, to serve uh, Canadians in such an effective way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Minister is part of the problem. Pre uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a Prime Minister that never shows up. He doesn't show up for work and he certainly doesn't show up for Canadians. It's no wonder that both rents and mortgages have doubled. It is no wonder that one in five Canadians are skipping meals. And it's no wonder that right outside these doors we have the largest public service strike in 40 years. So when will this Prime Minister show up to work and fix what he broke? The Honourable Minister for Families. The members on this side show up to work every single yep. day to work for Canadians. Seven days a week. And Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the public servants who did show up to work every single day mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic to deliver CERB to 8.5 million Canadians. Let's talk about the public servants who worked overtime to make sure that they could help Canadians access the services that they needed. Mr. Speaker, we respect collective bargaining. We respect the right to strike. We respect the fact that we are at the negotiating table having hard conversations, but at the end, we're going to get a good deal for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Exactly. Member for Haldeman Norfolk. We are experiencing the largest public service union strike in over 40 years. Even though this government has spent 50% more, 21 billion more on bureaucracy, that's some special kind of incompetence. And still, the public sector service is demoralized. This government has wasted $22 billion of, on liberal connected contracts on outside consulting firms. When will this Prime Minister get to work? and fix the mess that he created. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, it's important for us to compare and contrast with what the Conservatives did because since 2006, they didn't increase Vote A funding for core services to any of the services that we provided to Canadians. And so that means that as the population of Canada continued to grow, we actually have been spending since we came into government in 2015 to deliver services for the population that we have. Unlike the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, we know that we need to deliver good services for Canadians. We've made those investments and we're seeing 
seeing those investments delivered to Canadians. They can talk about cuts, they can talk about yep. austerity, but we're going to continue to they invest in austerity. government and most importantly in Canadians. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, Canadians need a leadership and accountability from this Prime Minister. Canadians are paying for the lack of leadership of this Prime Minister. Maybe he doesn't care about passport lines because he's never had to wait in one. That's right. Maybe he doesn't care about broken exactly. airports because he flies on a private jet. Right. Maybe he doesn't care about small businesses because he's never had to balance a budget. That's right. When will this Prime Minister get down out of his ivory tower and start serving Canadians? Yeah. 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 The Honourable Government House Leader. I'm not sure what the member opposite is saying. Is the member opposite saying that the Prime Minister should not have security or should not be flying in a circumstance where his security is protected? Of course, they're playing games as they usually do. Uh, they try to mischaracterize things that have to happen to try to twist them for a partisan advantage. But what has happened, Mr. Speaker, is that Canada now is leading the world in terms of economic growth, in terms of job production, and at a time when the world is going through the most difficult time humanity has faced in the Second World War, the only thing the Conservative have to offer is fear and despair, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Let me get this straight. So the Prime Minister has increased the spending in the bureaucracy by 50 per cent, increased the cost of the public sector by more than $21 billion, and yet the vital services that Canadians rely on, whether that's immigration, passports, airports, have never been this dysfunctional. And in fact, now we have 150,000 public sector workers on strike, the largest job action in more than 40 years. Who could possibly be that incompetent? Only this Prime Minister can spend so much to achieve so little. Exactly. Will the Prime Minister stand up, do his job, and fix the government that he has broken? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Sports. Well, we've been hearing the Conservatives today attacking the investments that we've made in the public service because you'll remember that when they were in power, they cut mercilessly in the public service like never before with austerity measures, with unprecedented cuts, and that's without counting all of the acts that they tried to pass to limit the rights of unions and to destroy unions in Canada. So today, hearing them complain about uh, the strike of our public servants is, well, it's not surprising to hear them complain about that. Thank you. For foothills. Why isn't the Prime Minister the one standing up and answering for his own failures? Why isn't the Prime Minister standing up and doing his job? I'll tell you, he's not worried about lines at the passport office because he never had to stand in one. He's not worried about the chaos at the airports because he has a private jet. He's not worried about skyrocketing food prices or Canadians scavenging dumpsters to feed their families because he doesn't have to pay for it. And he's certainly not worried about struggling small businesses because he's never had to balance a budget. When will the Prime Minister stand up, do his job, and douse out this dumpster fire that he has created? The Honourable Minister for Immigration. My Honourable colleague is asking what the Prime Minister is standing up for. He's standing up for the people who live in my community, like the low-income families who now receive more through the Canada Child Benefit than they did when the Conservatives were in power. He's standing up for workers' rights to collect their Canada Pension Plan that the opposition leader has criticized as being too expensive to properly fund. He's standing up for workers who've been impacted by natural disasters on my coast in Atlanta, Canada, to make sure they're supported with EI when they lose their job as a result of conditions beyond their control. Mr. Speaker, every day of the week, we're going to stand up for working families and communities like mine. I'd invite the Conservatives to join us one day. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister tells us that he's not involved with the, found uh, the Trudeau Foundation and hasn't been for 10 years. Well, okay, but a year after he became uh, Prime Minister, China decided to make a donation of $140,000 to the Foundation in honour of his father. And yet, Mr. Speaker, nothing comes for free in this world. So what is China's interest in funding a foundation which gives uh, money to Canadian students? To help students? Uh, by pure altruism? Well, <laughs> come on. Or was their goal to get closer to the son of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who coincidentally had just been elected Prime Minister? The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, is the implication of the question from the other way, uh, from across the way, that China 
is responsible for policy here in Canada or that the government is influenced by that. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous, Mr. Speaker. And that's not the case at all. Uh, throughout my entire life and throughout uh, uh, the member's uh, life, we have been protecting our democracy. Uh, things are difficult right now for democracies. And, Mr. Speaker, we need to stand together to protect our democracy. The Honourable Member for trois -Rivières. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, for everyone who's watching this uh, story, it's impossible not to ask uh, uh, questions. We're in the middle of a crisis of foreign interference from China. On the one hand, we have the Prime Minister, uh, who's closely linked to the Trudeau Foundation. On the other hand, we have China, which is paying a lot of money to get as close to the Foundation as possible. And in the middle, we have a referee, a special rapporteur chosen by the Prime Minister, a friend of the Prime Minister, and also a member of the Foundation. So there's reason to ask questions here. How can the government even hope to re-establish trust by doing anything other than by holding a public independent inquiry? The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, yes, it's possible to attack uh, uh, Mr. Johnston. It's possible to do that. But he is the former Governor General. He was put uh, into that position by uh, Prime Minister Harper. So his independence is absolutely crystal clear, Mr. Speaker. And it's also clear that we need to protect our democracy. And the only way to do that is to stand together to fight foreign interference, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle. Mr. Speaker, Morris Rosenberg, who uh, wrote the independent report on foreign uh, interference in elections, wants a public independent inquiry. Jean-Pierre Kingsley, the former chief electoral officer, also wants an inquiry. Gerald Butts, the former advisor to the Prime Minister, wants an inquiry. The House of Commons wants this inquiry. Quebecers and Canadians want th this inquiry. And now Michael Wernick, the former uh, clerk of the Privy Council, also is calling for this inquiry. So at the end of the day, aside from the Liberals and the authorities in Beijing, there aren't very many people who don't want this inquiry. So what are they waiting for? <laughs> The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Foreign interference is, is an issue that we take seriously, and it is not a partisan issue. That's why we appointed David Johnston, a nonpartisan and an experienced professional. It's unfortunate the members opposite laugh when I mention his name, Mr. Speaker. A gentleman who has given his life to this country, who will provide us with with information that we will be acting on, including whether or not we, we hold a public inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, Canada is now faced with the largest public sector strike in 40 years, despite the government spending $21 billion more on the bureaucracy. More Canadian jobs were created in 2021 by the government, and yet service levels are down. That takes a special kind of incompetence to have more spending and less results. The Prime Minister is failing taxpayers who deserve access to public services. So when will the Prime Minister fix the government? that he broke. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Our government respects collective bargaining. Our government respects having a negotiated settlement at the negotiation table. But, Mr. Speaker, let me have the opportunity to talk about exactly what's in our budget that was prepared with and by public sector workers with our own government members. Mr. Speaker, in my own city of Edmonton, Heidelberg Materials is going to create the world's first yes. net zero cement plant, $1.36 billion worth of investment. Why? Because the tax credits are right in the budget. Thousands of jobs, national leadership, international first, right in Edmonton, thanks to our government. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, why doesn't the Prime Minister get up and answer questions? Because he doesn't care. You know, Canadians are getting sick and tired about hearing about the Prime Minister's free, lavish vacations. At the same time, while hearing about Canadians diving in dumpsters looking for food, Canadians are getting sick and tired of waiting in lines for services. They're getting sick and tired of trying to balance their home budgets. It's a special kind of incompetence to be failing so badly. So when will the Prime Minister get Get to work to fix the problems that he created. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to respond to, to my colleague and say one kind of competence we have on this side of the House is that we listen to Canadians. And that's exactly what we did in the last budget, something that they would not like to talk about, Mr. Speaker. But in the last budget, we listened to Canadians. What did they say? Help us with grocery, Mr. Speaker. That's why we came with the rebate on grocery. 11 million Canadians will benefit from that. That is listening. The second thing they say, we want a family doctor. That's why we invest in health care. The third thing they say, build the economy of the future. That's why we got Ericsson to invest here in Ottawa, close to half a billion dollars. That's how you build an economy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Lisa chemin -Lévy. The Prime Minister went on holiday with his family in Jamaica. So far, so good. But what's not so good, Mr. Speaker, is that he went to a villa that rents for up to $9,000 a night, a villa that belongs to rich friends of the Prime Minister, and those friends are also donors to the Trudeau Foundation. How can this Prime Minister be so disconnected that he didn't think this through ahead of time? If he wants to earn back some of the credibility that he's almost completely lost, can the Prime Minister tell this House that he paid out of pocket the costs for uh, the vacation for him and his family. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, these questions, well, we've been asked, uh, answering them day after day, but the real question is for my colleague. She's a former CBC uh, Radio Canada journalist. Does she agree? Does she agree with the attitude um, of her leader who wants to shut down the public broadcaster, who's attacking information, who's attacking journalists, and who's attacking our democracy? Does she agree with that, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. accessing services during the PSAC strike. The union is ready to work with the departments to ensure that veterans can maintain that access, but the minister refuses to talk to them. In fact, the minister hasn't met with the union president for over two years. This is disrespectful and puts our public servants and veterans at risk. What is he scared of? Will the minister do his job by taking, talking to the union, or will he continue to ignore his responsibilities to both veterans and to the union? The Honourable Minister for Veterans Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank my honourable colleague for a question, and I have met with the union leadership, I have met with union people, I have met with Veterans Affairs employees. We have increased our funding to Veterans Affairs by over $11 billion. My mandate is to make sure, and this government's mandate is to make sure we take care of our veterans. We have and we will continue to take care of our veterans. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. While this government refuses to give public sector PSAC workers a fair deal, the Prime Minister enjoys complimentary luxury family vacations courtesy of his billionaire friends. And don't be fooled by the Conservatives. While the leader of the official opposition was in government, he always sided with big CEOs. So, Mr. Speaker, at a time when families are struggling to put food on the table, the Prime Minister ignored red flags from inside his own office. Why, why does the Prime Minister keep showing bad judgment by cozying up to the billionaires instead of fighting for everyday Canadians? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, for the third day in a row, I'm, I, I'm happy to talk about this if this is their priority. Yes, the Prime Minister went on vacation with his family over Christmas. This is a home that he had been at since he was one, when he was one years old. It's a friend that he's had for his entire life. It's a family friend that's gone forever. I don't know if the member opposite has stayed at a friend's house before over Christmas or done something like that. But in any event, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've answered this question. I would imagine that there's other more pressing things that Canadians are facing than spending three days asking about whether or not the Prime Minister took a family vacation over Christmas. The Honourable Member for Thunder Bay, Rainy River. Speaker, sadly my kids spend half their lives on the internet. Even my two-year-old Miko needs his daily dose of Paw Patrol or his or my favourite Peppa Pig. But the internet isn't just for kids. I think of all of us in our daily lives would have a hard time getting by without access to the internet. I know our government has done a lot to help rural Canadians access the internet, but can the Minister of Rural and Economic Development please update this House on a recent broadband announcement and what this will mean to us in Northern Ontario? Thank you. Honourable Minister for Rural and Economic Development. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague and friend for his advocacy on part, not only on, on behalf of his constituents, but all for rural and remote Canadians. Mr. Speaker, last month we did, in partnership with the Government of Ontario, announce an investment of $61 million that's going to bring high-speed internet service to over 16,000 homes throughout 47 rural communities and three First Nation communities in Northern Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, Miko can tell his friends that live in Hymers and Moose Hill and surrounding Thunder Bay areas that they're now going to have better access to essential services, more opportunities to grow their business, and keep in touch with loved ones and their friends. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. For eight years, these Liberals have repeatedly broken ethics laws. The Prime Minister caught breaking ethics laws twice. The Trade Minister, the Intergovernmental Affairs Minister, the Par Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, and they got so sick of getting found guilty that they appointed the sister-in-law of the Intergovernmental Affairs Minister to be the new Ethics Commissioner. Only problem is they got caught, so she resigned. So will the Prime Minister stand today and assure Canadians that he's not going to appoint any more friends, family, or Trudeau Foundation members to this important position? Good question. The Honourable Government House Leader. The person that uh, they're referring to uh, was appointed actually under Stephen Harper uh, when he was Prime Minister, worked in that office for 10 years. Uh, We actually started early, but I think we're losing some time here. I'm not sure when we're going to get out of question period, but maybe we'll ask the government house leader to start over from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, uh, the person that, the, uh, that they're referring to had worked in the Ethics Commissioner's office for 10 years. She was number two in that office. She was appointed uh, or came into that position uh, under the, uh, the when Stephen Harper was, in fact, Prime Minister. And what happens when they attack people uh, and they engage in these partisan attacks is, yes, those people do leave uh, because they don't, because this is what happens. So uh, their partisan attacks, whether or not it's on CBC or the Ethics Commissioner, whatever they Go. Uh, yes, it has an impact. Uh, that position is now vacant. It's an extremely important position. We'll work as fast as possible to get a replacement. Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Well, uh, I mean, wo woe is them, I suppose, woe but I think they're probably just sad that they couldn't get that family and friends discount. They've tried to get the, the bulk purchasing discount or the frequent flyer discount with the Ethics Commissioner's office, and that didn't work. Maybe this time, though, they'll just leave the job empty so that when there is the next conflict of interest, there's no one there to investigate it. Well, when there were, then they're following that path, perhaps they'll just eliminate the position of the Ethics Commissioner altogether. The question is very simple. He wasn't able to answer it, so we'll, we'll put it this way. Which will it be? Will they appoint a family member, a friend, or a Trudeau Foundation board member to be the next Ethics Commissioner? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as always, we will appoint uh, qualified people who are working in those positions with expertise, and that ensures is what we're going to do in the future. But what we've seen, Mr. Speaker, over the last three days, as we're going through some of the most difficult times in human history, around the planet, as there is a war in Ukraine, as our planet is being ravaged by climate change. I wonder, 20, 30 years from now, when people are looking back on these question periods and watching the priority of Conservatives, they'll wonder where the heck were they on the issues that actually affected Canadians, and why weren't they talking about or asking questions about the budget or Canadian finances or about the environment. I certainly wonder that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Megantic L'Érable. The Prime Minister knows we're going to ask about ethics and vi ethics violations. The Prime Minister violated ethics rules by going for a vacation on a private island. The Minister of Interna Intergovernmental Affairs gave a permit to a f business linked to his family. The Prime Minister again with SNC-Lavalin. The member for Hull Elmer, the Minister of International Trade. And we just learned that the sister-in-law of the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, the acting ethics commissioner, stepped down. So who will the prime minister ask advice from next time he wants to vacation with rich friends? The Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, what's very concerning for Canadians watching today is to see that the Conservative Party is completely stuck on issues that actually Canadians don't care about. What Canadians do care about is three things, and the Conservatives really ought to listen to what Canadians need. First of all, the cost of living. 
the cost of food. And that's why we have taken action for 11 million Canadians with a grocery rebate. Then access to a family doctor and health care. And thirdly, building the economy of the future. That's exactly what we're doing with Volkswagen that will be celebrating in St. Thomas tomorrow. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mégantic L'Érable. Mr. Speaker, what Canadians care about includes ethics. The Liberals don't care about ethics, but Canadians do. The Trudeau Foundation and its links with the Prime Minister, the Beijing regime and its influence on the PM, and his luxury tastes for vacationing with his rich friends, there will be a lot of work for the next ethics commissioner. And they should meet two essential requirements. Firstly, not being a member of the Trudeau Foundation, and secondly, not being related to a member of the Liberal Cabinet. Will the next ethics commissioner meet those two requirements, yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Health. Merci, Monsieur Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, many people in this House are wondering what opposition MPs care about. And they will care about the remarkable announcement that was made at the Davies Shipyard recently near Quebec City, including conservative colleagues from Quebec, from the Quebec City area, all of our colleagues will know how much this announcement will change and improve our economy, the environment. I am sure that even the Conservative colleagues that I see here in this House will be very happy to hear about this announcement. The Honourable Member for Santia saint Bagot, Mr. Speaker, Quebec was already shocked to see Ottawa giving Boeing a nine billion contract without a bid for tender and without any economic benefits for Quebec. It's even worse now that we know that the American, the American planes that it plans to buy are duds. According to reporting in La Presse, there are so many problems with these planes that they are spending half of their time under maintenance between 20, or they did between 2018 and 2020. We don't want to pay $9 billion for American lemons when we can build much better planes in Quebec. When will there be a proper bid for tender? The Honourable Minister, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Here on this side of the house, on this side of the house, we all understand the importance of the aerospace industry throughout the country, especially in Quebec. I have been in contact with Bombardier leadership, and we can all agree that Bombardier is an incredibly important Canadian company. On every occasion, we were there for Bombardier, and we always will be in the future. Thank you. The Honourable Member for saint yacinthe Bagot, Mr. Speaker, that was not a convincing answer. Let's sum things up. Ottawa is shoving Quebec aside and instead wants to buy American planes, which even the Americans don't want. This shows contempt for our aerospace industry, and yet we have all the expertise we need to assemble an airplane in Quebec. Ottawa has no right to offer $9 billion of our money without a bid bidding process to buy planes that don't even meet the most basic criteria. Will this government back down and have a proper procurement process? That would be the bare minimum. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we will never step down and we will always move forward to defend the Quebec aerospace industry. I think all of our colleagues are clear on that, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying to my colleague, we are in touch with Bombardier and the aerospace industry. And my colleague seems to have missed something important. Recently, we announced with the Quebec government the biggest ever investment in aerospace, the biggest in the history of Canada. We will always be there for workers in the aerospace industry. The member for Central Okanagan, Smilkanina Nicola. Mr. Speaker, yesterday Statistics Canada reported that mortgage interest costs rose 26 percent in March, the largest increase on record. Under this Prime Minister, mortgage costs have doubled, food bank usage is up, and he plans for commuters to pay 41 cents a litre in carbon tax. Does the Prime Minister see that Canadians are struggling, or is he so out of touch to believe that Canadians can just act like him uh, out of Jamaican villa and have their friends pay their bills for them. Yeah. 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 Minister for Housing. Uh, the Honourable Member should know that the people who are really out of touch are his colleagues who have said that we should pull back from federal investments in housing. It's the Honourable Member and his colleagues who have opposed real supports for first time home buyers. $40,000 tax free first home buyer savings account. 
They oppose that. They oppose the ban on foreign ownership of Canadian real estate. They've, they've opposed the vacancy tax. They've opposed investments in uh, affordable housing. They've opposed supports for renters. Not only did they oppose that, they pl played procedural games to delay much needed rental supports, Mr. Speaker. Right. Member for Central Okanagan, Smilkini Nicola. Well, well, talking about delays, that minister is the minister of delays. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation reported 11 percent drop in housing starts. This means we can expect higher rents as supply tightens, and more hardworking millennials will be stuck in their parents' basements. Right. If blaming others got housing built, this minister would have delivered results for hey. Canadians. When will this Liberal government stop blaming and start building? or are they just waiting for the Conservative leader to get it done for them? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Housing. The Conservatives are a nightmare for the goals of Canadians to, to access affordable housing, to access home ownership, to get help with rentals. They have voted against every single measure brought in this House to help Canadians with their real housing needs. We are the government that has brought back federal leadership in housing. And you would think that being in opposition would educate them on the need of the federal government to actually be involved and provide resources to housing. But instead, even in opposition, Mr. Speaker, all their members believe that we should actually pull back from investments in affordable housing. That is a shameful record to run on, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Deputy de The Honorable Member from Romani Lisele, Kamouraska, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, since this Prime Minister has been in power, the average price of mortgage payments has doubled in the country, and we're still, because of successive interest hikes, mortgage payments, mortgage interest payments have gone up by 26.4 percent between February and March. That's the biggest increase ever seen, and Canadians are continuing to take on more debt, or they have to give up on their dream of becoming homeowners. Will the Prime Minister finally do something to slow down the inflation that he himself created with his policies? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, the biggest gatekeepers to more housing supply, to more affordable housing, to supports for renters, to supports for home buyers, are the Conservatives. And how do I know that? Because every single time that we've brought sensible measures to this House to get supports for Canadian home buyers, to get supports for renters, to get supports for affordable housing and the most vulnerable, to increase supply in Canadian municipalities, what have they done? They vote against it. And then they have the nerve to come back to this House and talk about helping Canadians. Shame, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Laval, Les Îles. Mr. Speaker, this morning, our government tabled the Budget Implementation Act. This legislation will be essential in order to support a strong middle class, an affordable economy, and a healthy future. Can the Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance tell this House about some of the important measures that will be contained in this legislation. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Laval, Les Îles, for this excellent question and his hard work. If adopted, the Budget Implementation Act will help us to meet today's challenges and tomorrow's as well, building a safer, more sustainable and more affordable Canada for people from coast to coast. Here are some of the measures in the budget. An automatic advance on the Canada Workers' Benefit, doubling the deduction for tools, strengthening supply chains and trade corridors in Canada. These are all important measures, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Conservatives are voting against. Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the top secret discord leaks from the United States said this Prime Minister has no intention of ever meeting our NATO commitment. It states many of our allies are frustrated and disappointed by Canada's response to the recent global crises like Haiti and Ukraine. The Prime Minister has once again embarrassed Canada on the world stage, and his empty promises have killed our reputation as a trusted ally. Why does this Prime Minister always waste billions of taxpayer dollars on his pet projects and lavish vacations, but refuses to invest in our military? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear. The Conservatives actively decided to step back and cut our defence spending and, and contributions. 
Let's not forget that it was the Conservatives who set our defence capacity back years by cutting military spending by billions and badly mismanaging our major procurement pro pro projects. We have worked hard, Mr. Speaker, to reverse this damage by raising spending year over year and delivering key equipment that our armed forces need to do their work. We will keep going, making necessary smart investments into our forces, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the Washington Post reported the Prime Minister told NATO officials privately that Canada will never meet the military alliance's defence spending target. But that's not what the Prime Minister is telling Canadians publicly. He's saying that Canada is a reliable partner to NATO, a reliable partner around the world. How does the Prime Minister square his private comments to NATO officials with his public comments to Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Canadian Armed Forces play an essential role in defending Canadians and supporting global security. As a founding member of NATO, our commitment to the Euro-Atlantic and global security is ironclad, Mr. Speaker, and we continue to make landmark investments to equip our armed forces. Overall, Canada's defence policy increases our defence spending by over 70 per cent. We also have announced over $8 billion in new spending in Budget 2022. We will continue to invest in our Canadian Armed Forces and deliver modern equipment to our military, which is renowned around the world for its excellence and professionalism, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, when the object over Canadian airspace was shot down by an American F-22 on February 11th, the Defence Minister said at the time that the process was sound and that it was NORAD doing what it's supposed to do. But yesterday, the Washington Post reported the Pentagon's assessment was that Canada's military response was delayed by one hour, necessitating U.S. assistance. How does the Defence Minister square her public comments with the Pentagon's assessment. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Have we said, as we have said, our government is making landmark investments to increase our ability to operate in and defend the Arctic, including announcing a robust $40 billion plan to modernize our continental defence. The most significant update to the Canadian NORAD capabilities in almost four decades, Mr. Speaker. We awarded a $122 million contract to strengthen the CFS alert. We are conducting joint exercises in the Arctic. We are purchased, we've purchased six Arctic offshore patrol ships, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do more as needed. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask some real questions and not just keep harping on about Christmas holidays. On Sunday in Japan, a G7 ministers meeting took place. Environment and climate ministers and Canada was there to promote more ambition in the area of fighting climate change and protecting biodiversity. While also promoting world energy security. Can the Minister of the Environment tell us about the progress that took place on these important goals? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for Pontiac for her question and leadership on this. As the British Minister for the Climate said, Canada played a key role to put an end to fossil fuel subsidies along with our G20 and G7 partners and to end our dependence on coal, all the countries in the G7 thanked Canada for its leadership on these matters and for what, for what occurred in Montreal with the COP15, the signature of an important agreement on biodiversity. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, the remains of Lindy, Linda Mary Beardy, a 33-year-old Indigenous woman, were found in the Brady landfill in Winnipeg. And on Saturday, 
The remains of another woman were found near the Red River. Mr. Speaker, they deserve to be honoured. They deserve justice. This ongoing genocide requires an urgent national response, including creating a nationwide red dress alert program. Should we go missing, Mr. Speaker? We must be found. Will this government take immediate action to implement a red dress alert and save lives now? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Public Safety. I want to thank the Honourable Member for her advocacy on putting in place a red dress alert across the country. As she knows, I have made a commitment to work with her on this, and in our budget was also included a um, commitment to work on a red dress alert. So I thank her for her advocacy, and I look forward to working with her to implement it. And of course, along with all members, we need to do better when it comes to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, Ashley Smith died in segregation in 2007 at the Grand Valley Institution for uh, uh, women. Then in 2016, while also in segregation, Terry Baker died at Grand Valley. An inquest into her death was called in 2017, but has been delayed twice. This time, because Correctional Services Canada wouldn't provide the necessary documents. They didn't even give a reason. Will the minister direct Correctional Services to stop stalling this important inquest? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, and our thoughts are with Terry Baker's family, friends, and all who knew her. We too were disappointed that the inquest was delayed because we hope that it will shed a light on the tragic and devastating events of 2016. I want to thank the honourable member for his advocacy, and I look forward to continuing to work with him on conditions of confine confinement, not only at GVI but at institutions across the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. I wish to draw the attention of members to the. Presence in the gallery. We'll go to the points of order as soon as I'm finished here.